Welcome once again to the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. I'm Dotson Adebayo and Tim Vickery, the legendino, is him. Yeah, that works. That, that works for me. That, that, that's yeah, correct yeah. identification. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't going to be incorrect. It was a very simple one. You know, him, H-I-M. <laughs> How can I go wrong? <laughs> well, pronouns that can be very controversial these days, can't they? Well, absolutely. 100% <laughs> right. You're on the ball clearly, which is good, because we're talking about a game that people in Brazil might remember as well, as people here in England. Actually, nobody here in England remembers this game. Indeed. Because indeed. got beat by Brazil. But the 10th of June, 1962, as always, if you're a newcomer to the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, we try and look at a particularly iconic game, a game that is of note uh, for one reason or another. So this is 1962 World Cup taking place in Chile, Tim, uh, and Brazil meet England. Is it for the first time? No. Uh, in fact, you should have known that because we did one about England beating Brazil at Wembley in 1956. Ah, um, of course, of course. But that was a friendly, wasn't it? That was Yeah. They'd met in the World Cup of 58, four years earlier, when it was a, it was a nil-nil draw. But this one is the quarterfinal. And it's the first time England have reached the quarterfinal of, of a World Cup. Um, so we are going back to a time, June 1962, which is before the Beatles and before England were world champions. Well done for bringing that in. I'll tell you why, because we're going to be talking, what we do with the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast as well, is have a look at the soundtrack of the time. And what Tim did there was slip in uh, part of the narrative of that soundtrack. Remember, this is before the Beatles and also before swinging London or sex, sex hasn't been invented, has it? I don't know no. where all those people came from if sex hadn't been invented, but it was um, come outside. <laughs> yes, yeah, we'll, we'll get on to that in a moment. What for? <laughs> <laughs> that was well done. I'm sure Wendy Richards would be proud of you wherever she is now. The late great, uh, oh, you do go on. on. I'm sure you had a few people say that to you in your time. <laughs> Although, and we're jumping the gun here. Remember, this is an English version of an American hit. Um, I didn't know that. Uh, well, I'd... it's not, it's a new song, but basically this is a ripoff of Baby It's Cold Outside. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, complete yeah, ripoff yeah, yeah, of yes. that. Baby It's well, Cold it's, Outside being it, the it, better it's song. A, it's a theme as old as the quills, isn't it, really? You know, this is true. This trying, is to, true. trying to chirp her into a, into, a, into a certain situation. Especially in those days when sex hadn't been invented and your old man wanted yeah, to Yeah, what were they going to do? Doing? <laughs> what were they going to do? What was Mike's son going to do with her? <laughs> Can we get to that in a minute? <laughs> yes. We've yes. talked about the football. So, uh, 10th of June, 1962, sex yeah, hadn't Yeah, I mean, been just, just thinking about this, I mean, we did England beating Brazil 4-2 at Wembley in 56. Yeah. And just think what's happening in those six years. Because at that point, England are seen as more likely then Brazil to win the 58 World Cup. Obviously, England go through the trauma of the Munich air crash with the, the death of, of, of some fantastic players. And it's Brazil who come through and win 58. So here we are in 62, where Brazil are the world champions, if trying to defend their, their, their throne, and England are playing the, the, the World Cup quarterfinal for the first time. So there's no doubt now who are the favourites and who are the underdogs. And that's just changed so much in six years. Having said that, though, and I'd see where you're going with that. Having said that, in this match, Brazil are without their mercurial World Cup winner, Pele, who by now everybody knows about. He's gotten injured, hasn't he, after the... Is it in the, the second round? game. Second, the second game, game, yeah. Second game. And th this is a real shame because this is Pele, 62, at his absolute peak. This is the finest Pele. Uh, Brazil open up their campaign against Mexico and he scores a goal. It's probably the greatest World Cup goal he scored. And it, 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 when he, he dribbles through the entire defence, it's, 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 it's a fantastic goal. And he's right at the peak of his powers. And 62 could have been what 86 was to Diego Maradona. But yeah, he gets I, injured I in the, in, exactly in, in, the, in the second thing. game. And mm. they desperately try and get him fit and try and get him fit and try and get him fit, but they can't get him fit. He doesn't play any further part in that World Cup. So it's Brazil without Pelé. Uh, one of the fascinating things about, about this game is the contrast in, in preparation because England are still totally in the amateur era. Um, the, the, the coach, manager, Walter Winterbottom, 
he doesn't even pick the team. There's a there's a selection committee of, of doddery old FA FA it's like cricket, uh, isn't it? It's, yeah, they think exactly. they're playing cricket. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, they need to warm up because cricket is a game that's slow. You know, there's no proper preparation, and the team that they went to Chile without a doctor. There was a player who nearly died when, when they were there. The organizer, the, the the disorganization was total. And Bobby Charlton writes about this. He said that he won't name names. But there were people there in England, England, not the players or not the first team. So players who were the reserves. Remember, there are no substitutes. So if you're not in the first team, you're just kicking your heels. There were players there saying, Look, can we lose this one so we can all go home? You know, homesickness and, and a total amateur disorganisation. I told uh, Brazil's left winger, Mario Zagalo, later on the coach, I told him that Brazil, that England went to the World Cup without a doctor. And he just couldn't believe it because on the Brazilian side, everything is rigorous scientific preparation. They've got doctors, dentists, physical preparation specialists. They really, really take it. it, it it's, it's actually a metaphor for what was happening in Brazil at the time. Uh, Brazil was like a rising power. Remember, it was just building Brasilia, the capital city. And, and the whole idea is there's a, there's, there's a modern technocratic elite guiding the poor people to a developed future and that that's exactly what the football team was uh joao havalange that then, then became fifa president he's the big man, man at the, in brazil's fa and he's got them really organized full of specialists there's a whole team of specialists helping to 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 get the most out of the the individual talent that they've got so on the one hand the Brazil thing is very scientific and technocratic. On the other, there's a mad belief in status. The fact that this team won the World Cup four years, four years earlier, means they are world champions forever. They have attained the status of world champions. And it's the same team. But they, they have to make one or two changes. One of the, the centre-backs, Orlando Pesanha, has gone to play in Argentina. And at that time, Brazil don't pick players who play abroad. So they have to replace him. Um, there's a change at the other centre-back changes where Bellini, who was a captain in 58, is replaced by his reserve, Mauro. Um, but it's just, you know, one goes to the bench and the other, it, 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 it's, it's exactly the same, the same squad. So it, uh, it, it is the same team, just four years older. Almost everyone is over 30. It's, it's, a, it's an old team. And in fact, any of the ones who could still stand up in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a stiff breeze went to England four years later. It's that idea that they've attained the status of world champions, so they will always be, be world champions. So it was an old side. Um, the, 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 only, the only kid in there is Pelé. And then they lose him. I think the next next youngest was someone like 28, 29, you know, and, and most of them are, are over 30. Nilton Santos, the left back, is 37. Um, so it, it's an old side and they struggle a little bit. They, uh, they, they, have a, uh, they, they draw against Czechoslovakia when they lose Pelé. If they lose to Spain in the next game, they go out. And it, it's, a, it's Spain are a, a good side. It's a tough, tough game. It's when Gahincha wakes up. And he's the man who's going to prove the difference between these, the, these two sides on this, on, on this day. The day where England, with all of their amateur preparation, pushed Brazil quite hard. It's, uh, it's, it's a competitive game. It's a very interesting game. Unfortunately, I saw the, old, the whole game was on Brazilian TV last year during the, during the, the, the port. So I saw, I saw the whole game. The, the, the TV images are black and white and, and, and they're very, very grainy. Um, and the, the Brazilian commentator keeps moaning about the cold for, for understandable reasons. I've been there, Chile, Chile in June. And that's like yeah, yeah, it this is. is. It's Whitsunbank holiday in the UK. You know that? Whitson I, Bank. Didn't know. I, I, I never even knew what Whitson was, but I always used to enjoy the bank holiday because that was the time. <laughs> but it dodge. always rained, didn't it? Always? Didn't yeah, it always rained? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. You're absolutely right. Um, could the metaphor from the English perspective be more I mean, talking about the uh, lack of preparedness etc i wonder if the metaphor from the english perspective is that uh, hang on a second we had an empire till just the other day and not only that we brought football to this continent because there's a certain kind of 
aloofness and arrogance. And I've seen just the clips of uh, this match. Garincha is the person that the clips focus on. It's almost like, forget everybody else, Garincha. And by the way, I didn't think he was all that brilliant from this match, but you could correct me on that because when I look with today's eyes, I'm like uh -huh. thinking, well, he's got, he's got no tricks up his sleeves. He's mm -hmm. the dribbler and all he does is like, a back pass, you know, a, a healed back pass is like a great move. And I thought, well, I can do that. I've been able to do that since I was eight years old. Can't go forward, trap the ball with your sole of your feet and back pass it. Uh, what? What skill was needed there? And sometimes, often enough, and I know you've talked about his bow legs a few times, often enough, all he does is a drop of his shoulders and then just goes one way. And, you know, sometimes that's enough, but he doesn't show any skills. I expected him to be the Cristiano Ronaldo of his day or whatever it might be. But There's a bit early in the game where he just gets cleaned up by big Norris, Morris Norman, who's mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the big Tottenham centre-half. You know, that, that was great. That was <laughs> watching watching our centre-half from, from 62 just clean it. Wow. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Although the, the bit that I remarked on was the frustration from Bobby Charlton when, you know, he's trying to stop uh, Garincha, who's the right winger, from going past him. And you could just see the utter frustration in Bobby Charlton. And I'm like, Bobby, man, you, you play this game. You know how it works. Sometimes you're going to get, you're going to face somebody who can move past you. But it was kind of like, oh. but now that you've said that Bobby Charlton mentions the, you know, wider frustration in, in his um in his biography, in his book, then I can perhaps understand that a little bit more. But I just, I look at that and think, there is a kind of an aloofness and an arrogance and a how dare he. Um, great work from Ray Wilson, who is on the team sheet as Ramon Wilson. So clearly a Brazilian <laughs> wrote the England team sheet. But um, Ray, or Ramon, or whatever. Uh, Ray Wilson does hold him. He does. But he was a great player. And he's, but, he, he's one of the few players who's still around four years later. You know, there's, yeah. there's and, three from, from that team who are still around four years later. And what he's learned from Garincha is that you stand up to Garincha. Do not preempt it because you're going to end up on your backside. So every time Garincha's got the ball. So Ray Wilson is the England left back. Uh, Garincha, the uh, Brazilian right winger. Every time Garincha's got the ball coming towards Ray Wilson, Ray Wilson doesn't he doesn't anticipate the move he stands up he stands his ground so Grinch has to work that little bit harder and generally what Ray Wilson is doing is pushing him towards the touchline pushing him towards the goal line basically but yeah. from a winger so he would have a narrow angle to 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 deliver the ball and that was a way to deal with him like I said I just wonder if the rest of the England players or most of the England players just thought this ain't supposed to happen that some little Brazilian ain't supposed to make us look silly. We are England. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, according to Charlton, because the, the, the previous game, England lost the first game to Hungary, beat Argentina 3-1, and only needed a draw with Bulgaria to qualify for the quarterfinals. Uh, and uh, everyone I've, ever, I've, I've read from Charlton and Bobby Moore and so they say it was the, the, the game against Bulgaria was the worst game they ever played in. It was an absolute disgrace because both sides are happy with a draw. So, you no, know, we'll have 10 men in our half. They've got 10 men in their half, uh, you know, and just nothing happened for 90 minutes. Uh, and, uh, and Bobby Charlton was furious. You know, it, 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 it was for him, it was a betrayal of the way that he'd been brought up to play the game. But the more experienced man, and the real class act in that side is, is Johnny Haynes. And Johnny Haynes, he plays his club football at Fulham. He really wants to go to Tottenham. You know, he's from Ed Edmonton, but he really wants to go to Tottenham because he wants to win stuff, but he can't. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you, you can't move in those days. The, the clubs own you, and Fulham's president is Tommy Trinder, comedian who comedian, knows yeah. the value. He know, and he makes Johnny Haynes the first one hundred pound a week football footballer, when because he knows the value of box office, and there's no way he's he's, he's going to let he's going to let uh, uh, Johnny Haynes go. So for Johnny Haynes, it's all about the World Cup. It's all that 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 that's it. And Johnny Haynes with the nil nil draw against Bulgaria, he's saying, "What's the problem? We've qualified for the quarterfinals. We've never done that before." Um, so I, I I don't think. And certainly after Brazil win winning in, 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 in 58, they're the favourites. I think that the, the kind of arrogance of the preparation is more like the kind of England, English gentlemanly amateur thing about it. You know, when it's, 
uh, with, with with the preparation, it's conceit conceit. You know, by the old kind of director class, it's considered a little bit unsportsmanlike to kind of prepare too much or to try too hard. You know, you're supposed to you're supposed to just turn up and and, and do it winning. off the cuff. It's not about winning. You see, this is what they told us at school. It's about you know taking part, uh, all that kind of nonsense. But I, I, I will concede uh, to your wisdom on this. Having said that, though, and we always take a look at the sort of news stories of the day to try and see what the, um, I suppose, landscape that these matches are played in is. I noticed, uh, and it was a Sunday, uh, the 10th of June, 1962, it was a Sunday. In the Observer of that day, uh, they mentioned the the uncoming, uh, the un uncoming, uh, the uncoming, what is the word? The uncommon uh, weather, the Whitson weather that's going to destroy uh, the rest of the weekend, the Whitson um, holiday weekend. But they don't mention a word about England playing against Brazil in the quarterfinals of the World Cup. I mean, I literally searched everywhere, all the pages, looking for even one line mentioned. It's amazing. It. Absolutely it? nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, there's a lot about the former colonies front page is ghana is accused by nigeria nigerian foreign minister uh, alleged that the ghana high commission in nigeria has become a center of subversion now why that is a front page story at that time is because you know these were the colonies we still looked at them as part of the wider united kingdom uh, six reject British plan for food preferences is the headline story, and it's all about Canada and New Zealand again, part of the but, yeah. the, the Commonwealth of countries. And also, in lots of British families, they had people who've moved. On one of my dad's sisters moved to Canada. One of his uh, is one of his his uncle moved to Australia. So th there were very personal relations. But with Africa, when I read stuff from that time. It seems to be a given that Africa is going to be a huge success story. Yeah, I think you have a point there uh, that something's going on. In fact, it is so much so seen as that, that anybody who from the African side who doesn't follow the kind of British narrative of what Africa is supposed to be like uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the Pan-Africanist who's become the first president of Ghana, well, they are treated I'll tell you how I feel they're treated. I once did an interview with Lord Carrington, you know, famously mm. um, you know, uh, conservative peer and the person who negotiated the unraveling of Unilateral Declaration of Independence, UDI, in what was then Rhodesia, and that was to become Zimbabwe. Yeah, so he was, had he was a foreign secretary, wasn't he? He, re he, was, he resigned he was. over the Falklands. Yeah, he was You're absolutely right. Foreign Secretary, I forgot about that. But basically, he was one that convened the so-called Lancaster House Agreement about Zimbabwe. So brought in the guerrilla um, leaders of Joshua and Coma on the one side and Robert Mugabe on the other side, you know, around the table to sort of like discuss um, the ending of the um, struggle in Zimbabwe. When I interviewed him, so he was living in a little apartment, I think it was like a basement apartment, certainly ground floor apartment, just behind Harrods in Knightsbridge in London. And this would have been about, uh, could it have been about 17, 18 years ago? Because he's like 100 years old now. He, he's still there. He's like 100 years old, Lord Carrington, believe it or not. But so then he would have been about 85 years old. Remember the interview very well. And he, so, so maybe Joshua Nkomo, somebody from that era had died. So that's why I went to interview him to uh, get his memories of the person concerned. And he started talking about um, uh, Robert Mugabe in particular, as you know, like he wasn't, let me just say, he wasn't being in any way discriminatory, but he's a man of his time. And he was talking of Robert Mugabe using, um, you know, the pronoun boy with regards to uh, Robert Mugabe. No, yeah, no, he was, but he wasn't, how can I say this? It is a challenging one. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting into an argument with, um, with Lord Carrington at all, but it took me by surprise that he was referee. He said, "No, he was. He was a. You know, he was good. He was a good boy. You know, Robert Mugabe in that way." I was like, "Whoa!" That was how a lot of the people were seen. 
anti-incrumer party founded says this front page a new political party dedicated to overthrow dr Nkrumah's mm -hmm. regime in ghana was launched in london yesterday that's on the front page of the observer that for me is even more shocking so you are trying to undermine the uh the legitimate president of ghana who's been in office at this point five years by giving um any sort of leverage to some group of people who decided we don't like him that was british just on, on the, the, the kind of lord carrington thing flipping it around the other way uh and i remember when i first moved to brazil i mean every every black person i ever knew in england they all supported brazil at football all of them for obvious reasons you know uh and i, I remember when i was first over here I was giving english classes to a lot of people in the financial market and there was one guy i don't think he was he was again he was a creature of his of his milieu uh, but he used to travel to international meetings and he, he told me that it really freaked him out having to sit down and, and talk on normal, you know, on level terms with black people, you know, because he, he's from the rich area of Rio and he said, well, all the black people I know, they treat me with subservience. They, 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 they recognize their, 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 their lower social position and that's the way that they treat me. And then, you know, it freaked him out to go. And I, I thought it was, it was quite cool of him to mm -hmm. admit this, to realize that, that this dynamic was what was going on. And he, 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 he talked about a meeting with one from, I think it was the English Financial Services Authority or whatever. And, and the, the expression he used was a uh, black person who's taken advantage of the English education system. And it was, you know, <laughs> but no, but th th that was a common kind of thing. That was, in fact, I would say you still get that, you still get that, and that's from contemporary. But the, but, and the, the thing that was that f this was coming from a Brazilian, and mm. the, 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 mm. these these were some of my first experiences, you know, because uh, it, it was it was learning about the relics of of feudalism and slavery, what they do to a society and how difficult because it, it, it goes totally against the conception that a lot of people had i think fewer people have it these days but the conception that and that, that brazil loved to present itself to the world as a racial democracy mm -hmm. as a place where where uh, where um problems of race have, have been have been overcome uh, and and finding out how far that was and is from the truth is was 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 a shock to me and finding i mean my stepdaughters they had uh they had a friend whose whose parents quite high up in the military i think whose parents beat her up for playing with black kids you know it just it, it, it shouldn't happen you know and, and uh i hadn't realized when i came here i hadn't hadn't realized but so that that's part of the dynamic of the of the brazilian football as well i mean I'll just go back quickly to to Gahincha, who wins the game, and with a great he, goal, by the way. Well, he, 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 all three are his in a way, mm -hmm. but the thing is, there's no Pele. It's an aging team. He's got to step up, and so he doesn't get much change out of Ray Wilson. But hang on a minute, I'm gonna I'm gonna rove. I'm not gonna bleed. I'm not gonna play on the right wing. I'm gonna play from the right wing. So he wanders across and he did things, he did things, especially in that game, that he never usually do, did. And the first goal is a header from a corner. He never did that. It's a really well-timed run. And imagine big English defenders, and there's there's, there's his right winger getting in to score a goal. The second one, the, the TV Im images capture it very, very badly. But um, it's a free kick that the England goalkeeper, Ron Spring, it can't hold. Uh, and uh, Vava, the centre forward, follows up and, and, and puts it in the, in the back of the net. And the third one, he's on the edge of the area, and it's just like a lazy waft, and the ball mm -hmm. flies, it flies into the top corner. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing there is a player. He hasn't got a lot of formal education, but he's read the game. He's, and he's read the needs of his side. He's done it himself. You know, he said, uh, he's thought, well, how can I be useful? Where can I, where can I bring my skill to bear? on this game it's not going to be st stuck out on the right wing i'm going to wander inside and that's him doing it 
So there's obviously a football intelligence working away there. Uh, and so often these things are told in terms of just instinctive talent. And there's obviously, there's obviously more to it because, uh, you know, that England side weren't a bad side. I mean, Bobby Charlton comes away from this game thinking, you know what, with all this disorganisation, we pushed them fairly close. I reckon if we get ourselves organised in four years' time, we can win this World Cup. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, 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 that's what happened. But I'm saying that in order to pay tribute to Gahincha, who was the difference between the two sides. And it's not just instinctive tricks and talent. You know, it's, there's a brain going on there and he's, uh, he's applying his ability to the benefit of the side. Who would the English equivalent have been of Gahensha in, in, in this match? Who, who, would that, who would the intelligent player, an intelligent forward maybe, with the football brain have been? Because well, we've got, we got a front four. We've got, we got Brian Douglas, who's, a, who's a, a neat little winger on the, on the right. The two to the middle, Hitchens, who scores the England goal. It's a, it's a header from Jimmy Greaves that comes back off the bar and then Hitchens volleys volley it in. Hitchens is the big English-style centre-forward who does nothing else in the game. The, the Brazilians eat him up. Greaves is, is a little artful dodger. You know, you, I, I loved watching this match for watching Greaves because I'm, I'm just too, too young for him. You, you saw him when he was, he was still at Tottenham. I'm just too young for him. Uh, the artful dodger thing. And then Charlton is on the left wing. He cuts in a little bit, but what Gahincha did in, in this game, it was the Charlton role four years later, when Charlton's not a winger anymore. Charlton is then mm. operating centrally behind the front two, and Alf Ramsey builds his side around Charlton. So uh, I suppose the nearest England, English equivalent would be Bobby Charlton. Yeah, having said that, not in this game, though. Not in this game. No. He wasn't using his intelligence. Well, he tries hard. His... No, yeah, he, he does he, try, but I think he's trying to fight a rear guard action um, much of the time, in which case you're not able to sort of think ahead because you're trying to stop um, the Brazilian play. Well, it's, it's indicative of the times that while he was there for that World Cup, he gets an offer from Boca Juniors. Oh. Who uh, uh, they, they, were, they were prepared to pay him much, much more than he's getting at, in English football. Much, much more. There was a sticking point that they thought because his wife was pregnant. Uh, and uh, so there's this, you know, you, you, you might want your kids to be English. Hang, hang on a bit. We'll arrange for your kid to be born in the British Embassy in Buenos Aires <laughs> so your kid can still, can still think, be British. I, th I think I've heard this story from you before, but I, I couldn't remember that it was at this time particularly that he got this. Well, he it's, turned it's it down. Close by. It's in, it's in South America. Yeah, he yeah of course. He turned it down. Yeah, I suppose Boca Juniors didn't have the cash tray they would have today. In fact, well, they had money. Probably, <laughs> they had cash. Well, they had money. And they didn't have cash. Eh? And, and they were probably you know, a better setup in those days yeah. than they are now. Yeah. You know, and now with all their players going overseas and stuff, it's not quite the same Boca Juniors, is it? Okay, so Brazil win this match and then they go on to win the World Cup as well. How yeah, they, they, beat, uh, they, they beat the host Chile in the semi-final, 4-2, another great Gahinja performance. He gets sent off at the end of the game and he's still allowed to play the final. Uh, there's some there's some there's some strings being pulled that shows you the political power of brazil uh in south in america well oh, in fifa as well okay. which is which has been run by stanley rouse the englishman and then they, um but he, he has a he has a flu or, or a cold on the day of the final so he doesn't do a lot in the final um and they play czechoslovakia in the final and, and win 3-1 the hero one of the heroes is is zito who's the box-to-box -box midfielder he's not one of those who's, who talks about a lot he's the one when gahincha cuts inside Zito moves from central midfield, he moves wide, wide right just to cover the space. One of those who's always doing what's necessary for the team. And the game against Czechoslovakia was a, was a, was a, a tough game in the final. And uh, Zito really wins it. On the vital goal, he starts to move on the edge of the Brazil area and finishes it inside the six-yard box in the, in, the, in the Czechoslovakia area. Real box to box. He's an unsung hero, Zito. He's a hard man. Uh, he was the midfield enforcer. He had, a, he had a lot more to him. Anyway, Brazil win that World Cup. But Charlton, as he's going home, he thinks, if we can get ourselves organised, we might be in with a chance, especially on home ground in four years' time. And Alf Ramsey comes in. And what's the first thing that Alf Ramsey says? What's I that? pick the team. I pick the team. None of, none, none of you, none of you fuddy-duddies. I pick the team. So, uh, um, belatedly, English football enters the modern age after well, this defeat. 
and like we said earlier, um, the musical backdrop to this is England or English music, British music, not quite in the modern age. So this is the precipice where uh, we are literally waiting for the Beatles to come. This is it, you know, by the end of 1962, Love Me Do uh, would have launched the Beatles and a English popular music. Do you know what they're uh, doing now? June of 62. They're, copying the, they're still copying the Yanks, aren't they? Well, the Beatles. You know what the Beatles are doing July of 60, uh, June of 62? Uh, are they in uh, in Hamburg at this point? They've just come back. They got a tele well, they're in Hamburg. They got a telegram from, from Brian Epstein saying, come back. I've got you an audition at EMI. So, and, and they're they're doing demo versions of Love Me Do and like Bisami Mucho and stuff like that, you know, while this while this World Cup is going on. Well, is, Bisami is, Mucho is going to make an <laughs> appearance in a moment or two. Is this stuff, this this chart with Elvis Presley on top, is this your stuff? How much how much do you love this this chart? Okay. Um and first of all, I just realised that actually Lord Carrington did die a couple of years ago, and I apologise for saying it um, slightly differently earlier. But, um, okay, let me talk about this chart. At number one is one of the most sublime uh, Elvis Presley songs, Good Luck so? Charm. Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. It's not yeah. from his days. It's not from his original days of, you know, um, breaking ground with uh, black music. Uh, as he did with the early stuff, particularly the stuff at Sun Records. It's not that, but in terms of Sublime, this is where Elvis Presley, you can see the trajectory of Elvis Presley yeah. from 1955 at Sun Records to going into the army, to going into the movies in Hollywood and to realizing actually um, my hero, and I'm thinking of Elvis Presley, my hero, Frank Sinatra moved on from yeah. being the leader or the singer with a jazz band to developing this whole style of his own, this sort of it, it, modern crooner the, style. It's hard for the kids to understand this, but Sinatra was seen as the first teenager. He was, he was, and he's still trying to hang on to some of that because he's in the charts with a song called Everybody's Twisting. So these are the years of twists. What has happened in the music business, both in the UK and the US, is they're in the doldrums. Things aren't moving forward. You know, the music of 1962 is still very much the music that's predicated on rock and roll in the 1950s. But then, you know, towards the end it's of the It's a watered night, down, isn't it? It and is. A lot of it's because with one or two exceptions that I hope we can talk yeah, about, but go on. Yeah, we will talk about them as well. I know exactly where you're going with the one or two exceptions. It's not Cliff Richard. It might be his well, band. No, I, I do love band. I do love the, the, the um, Do You Want to Dance? The, the Cliff but, was song. Oh, man, too. You I think it's a great song. The original, though. You must have heard the original by Bobby Freeman. It is, yeah, but I think Cliff does it well. Uh, I'm not sure about no? that. A lot of people right. do. I think the Ramones do it really well. You know, they're in, what, 10, 12, 15 years later, they're going to do it really 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 well they're going to rinse it out if you hear Bobby Freeman and he's not the greatest singer in the world but there is a sense of um he he wrote the song having feeling very comfortable with it uh Cliff Richard when he does a kind of it's like this with move it and the groove it as well Cliff Richard a dance song a straight up dance song doesn't work for Cliff Richard. It doesn't work for him. Uh, like it doesn't work for Elvis Presley. You know, Jailhouse Rock is fun, but it's not Elvis Presley at his best. You know, um, it's not a great song. Do you want to dance? But it's a vibe, isn't it? Do mm. you want to dance under the moonlight? Makes me happy. It does. That's exactly what it does. And I'm not sure if that was sufficient to give... Uh, Cliff Richard, the personality he needed to carry off that song. And even Bobby Freeman, when, if you see, if you go on the internet and you see the video of him performing this song at some TV program in the States, they force him to dress up in a sort of a ringmaster, circus ringmaster's uniform, and then they bring on a baby elephant. And, <laughs> yeah, well, that is a disaster. That, that is a disaster. It's going to shit all over the floor, just well, like it, it did when I got an elephant on Blue Peter. 
exactly <laughs> except it doesn't this elephant is so well trained the poor elephant and the audience are just like clapping along thinking oh, it's not unusual to be <laughs> loved by anyone or to have an elephant come <laughs> onto your stage show in a tv studio as well imagine if that elephant had suddenly got into its head gosh Oh, this is terrifying. I'm going on a rampage. Mm -hmm. There'll be people mm -hmm. dead all over the place. Mm -hmm. But Bobby Freeman is there trying to make sure the elephant is nice and calm. And then the elephant starts moving its head in time to the music. It's obviously some kind of distress signal saying, I mm -hmm. am not very, mm -hmm. do you want to dance mm -hmm. under? And this is the, they're treating it as a novelty song, which I think is a shame. Anyway, mm -hmm. Cliff Richard number two with that. What is interesting is number three. Nut Rocker, B Bumble and the Stingers, <clears throat> which is a, I think, a very ingenious take on Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker, uh, the, the marching song in, or the marching theme in The Nutcracker. So they've taken a classical song from a hundred and some years before this, 150 years before this, and they've turned it into a real rock and roll stomper. I mean, I don't know anybody who's been as original in taking classical music and turning it into something that's fun and educative and uh, original. I think that's brilliant. They're, they're an American band, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah. I can't remember who they were, but they're, they're showing some originality here. Whereas Elvis is at number one in command of his empire. You know, I am still the king of rock and roll at this point. Nut Rocker with Bee Bummer and the Stingers says, no, there's a lot of musicians out there who are creative and doing much more creatively than Cliff Richard, than Elvis Presley, than Adam Faith, who is in the charts at number five with As You Like It, still trying to do a kind of a, uh, an Elvis Presley. Well, his is more kind of a Buddy Holly thing. You know, he's got that, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, the hiccup mm -hmm. sound of Buddy yeah. Holly. Billy Fury is certainly trying to be um, Elvis Presley. And the, the, the British artist, Billy Fury coming from Liverpool with Last Night Was Made For Love, the British artists are trying to be Elvis when Elvis went on this trajectory in 1958 of being clean cut, preppy, college boy kind of thing. They're still there. Whereas remember what I said, Elvis has moved on to the movies. Yeah. But so they yeah. haven't quite because there isn't a Hollywood well, here. This, so. this, this, yeah, this is Larry Parnes, isn't it? This is the exactly. stable. Exactly. Is... I'm glad you know that. Larry Parnes, shillings and pence is behind all of these people. Half of them in the charts: Billy Fury, Adam Faith, Eden Kane. Do you remember him? Now, yeah. Now, I think that this is wild. I think it's great. The, the, mm. uh, the Eden mm. Kane song. I don't know why. I mean, it's you know, it, it suits up. It's great. What I hadn't realised is he's, he's a, a brother. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a brother of Peter. Where Sonsa. did he go to, my yeah, lovely? Well, yeah. <laughs> that was my line, you know. <laughs> I saved that one up for a whole week. But hey, I, I, I thought that was the most genuine rock rock and roll thing. His voice is amazing, isn't it? Mm. His, his voice is actually quite original and powerful. And um, the song's all right, but I think it's his voice that carries it. Yeah, That's what yeah. Billy Fury doesn't have. You know, Billy Fury's got this, I'm trying to be Elvis, but with orchestration. You know, um, and his voice lets him down. I didn't realize Billy Fury was such a poor singer because I'm thinking of Halfway to Paradise, which yeah, just that's, about that's the one carries I like. off. Yeah. yeah, he just about carries off. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but in this, he's singing a bum note, and it's a big bum note. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, no, he did. They let that one go. Mm -hmm. He obviously couldn't reach whatever uh, pitch he was supposed to reach, and he ends up doing this. Picture well, of you by Joe Brown. Yeah, which is it's kind of novelty. Now, I used to have a uh, that when I was a, a young kid, and when we had a Picture copy of, of that. Yeah, it's not bad Joe song, Brown and the, and the, oh, it's all but, right. And, and he was much more original than the other Larry Parnes lot. Yeah, he had a personality, scene. didn't he? Hence the fact that he, he, he lasted. Because a lot of these these people, their careers as singers are just destroyed by the Beatles. They? They, they, they've I got nowhere. So on people like on Adam hurrah. Faith become yeah. becomes an actor. Later on in the charts, there's um, there's John Layton. Yeah, he's an actor as well. He well, he's one actor. of the very few in The Great Escape who, who escapes. Exactly. He gets away in The Great Escape. Exactly. 
Exactly. So that was they his escape. Him. Well, they needed him in The Great Escape because they wanted to bring the younger uh, listeners into the <laughs> film yeah. as well, into the cinemas. Uh, and then you've got some, I mean, The Party's Over by Lonnie Donegan should be a great song. But, you know, that doesn't work because Lonnie Donegan's made too much of a fool of himself with, yeah. you know, my old man's adjustment. So he suddenly tries to sing a serious song. The Party's Over is a proper serious song. You know, if you think about uh, what the party is and it's about life or whatever it might be, but just doesn't work for no me. it doesn't it doesn't quite have the gravitas for it the greatest i think it shouldn't be overlooked greatest original contribution british contribution in these charts is made by jet harris uh, the greatest or the most innovative bass player i think that's come out of the united kingdom both as part of cliff richard's band but also on his own with Bessame Mucho that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Bessame Mucho is in the charts at number 22. He's where originality comes in. And you can see where George Harrison is going to go. Uh, so not so much George Harrison, but uh, I would say that Beatles kind of, uh, or Merseyside beat, and perhaps even the Rolling Stones, you can see where they're going to go. Where wh- wh- I should have said about George Harrison, I meant more that Hank Marvin, because... Uh, Jet Harris is a member of uh, Cliff Richard's uh, backing band, um, which were initially called the Drifters, you know, before they mm. realized, oh, no, we can't call ourselves the Drifters, because there's another American band called the, so they became the Shadows. And Jet Harris and Tony Meehan, who's the drummer, become uh, the, uh, the, or they make up the quartet of the, uh, 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 with the Shadows with Hank Marvin and Bruce, what's his name? Um, can I remember? The rhythm guitarist. But there, they're they're not so distinct again they're trying to do a kind of a buddy holly guitar thing but that is going to influence the beatles as well remember on the second it's massive isn't it because yeah, it, this, yeah, this is british yeah. kids doing it and showing it can guitar it, it, and, and showing it can be done it's showing that guitar bands are the future yeah, you know? yeah maybe with vocalists but guitar bands are the future this is it coming in now we're seeing it in broad daylight and it helps the beatles a lot actually yeah and they, really they, well they're in because they can watch this on tv i mean it's very mm-hmm. hard to watch anything there's, there's, there's no tv you know there's hardly any but you can watch and you can try and work out the chords that hank's playing and so on it's really really important there's and, one who fascinates me in, in in this chart which is um helen shapiro Oh, brilliant. Oh, what a voice. Um, she is the original Amy Winehouse. I'm pretty sure she was Jewish as well. Yeah, she oh, is. Yeah. Still, and she, yeah, still, she still is, although she's now a millennial yeah. Jew, you know, which is a Jew that believes in Jesus Christ. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that yeah, it's, it's, it's been her life for, for, for the, it, it's, it's how she's kind of reinvented herself in the last few decades. Okay. So what, what fascinates me about her is... And she she really has a voice. I think she, she's she's a real like real. Like I say, that's Amy Winehouse. You know, Amy Winehouse is modelled entirely on this woman, Helen Shapiro, who kicked off at the age of about thirteen. But as we were saying, like the the, the Beatles kind of ended the the singing careers of lots of these people, and you know, people like Adam Faith and John Lane, they went they went off into acting. Billy Fury tried uh, with, with the one we did on sixty three, Johnny Kidd. Mm-hmm tried to move into Mersey beat, mm, mm. That, that kind of sound. Mm, it didn't work for him. No, it didn't work well. And, you know, and he, he died tragically young, yeah. soon afterwards. But with Helen Shapiro, what I can't work out is why she wasn't able to survive. Well, Because it, there's real talent there. And Dusty totally. Springfield did it. You're Dusty right. Springfield was able to reinvent herself. And she rode on the coattails of Motown. You know, she but, became the, the British Motown... Uh, friends with Martha Reeves, and then she goes off to, to to the states to record. Now Helen Shapiro has that talent. Oh, there's one of her, her songs, um, uh, "Tell Him What I Said," okay. which is so sweet. It's so beautiful. It got picked up as a favorite by the Northern Soul crowd a few mm-hmm. years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're thinking, why couldn't Helen Shapiro make that transition in the same way that, that, that Dusty Springfield did? It fascinates me, that. Well, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, Walking Back to Happiness obviously was a big hit, and you could hear there the maturity in her voice, but it was so very much predicated on the American female singers of the times, like Connie yeah. Francis and so on. That's why, you know, she wore the big rah-rah skirts and everything. Dusty Springfield never really attached herself. In fact, D- Dusty Springfield was able to transition from one uh, format to another because um, she was like a folk singer. Yeah, initially yeah with... kind of folky-wokey band. Exactly. You, know, really. you see, that's more adaptable because a folk singer allows you to go from being... Um, 
you know, a, um, a traditionalist to being, because a lot of this music is predicated on folk music. If your career has been connected to that kind of era of rock and roll, then how do you go from that to Motown and people still take you seriously? It does sound as if, I mean, the person as, that is as able to do up, it. As, you, as you're growing yeah, up with your, yeah. with your audience, I would have thought there would, there would be a poss possibility to do that. I think, first of all, she did kind of take a break from the music industry. No, she, she tried She tried for a while and it didn't really work. It didn't and then, work. And then when she kind of came back, she'd obviously spent too long as a kind of nightclub yeah. singer or working. And, she, yeah. you know, there was, there was nothing, there was no cutting edge there. Do, do you not think also, though, that whereas, we, whereas we're rightly saying that the likes of Marty Wilde and other of the Pans, Shillings and Pens people mm -hmm. that was in the charts at number 23, whereas all these people are having their last hurrah and they will... But they don't know it, do they? they don't no, know. They don't know, yeah. This is the, the, the end of Rome. This is the, you know, yes. the, the rise and fall of uh, whatever it is, last days of Rome. Um, even though they will all be casualties of the Beatles, there were some unfortunate casualties of which mm. Ellen Shapiro was yeah. one. Because I'll tell you what another one is. Pre-Beatles, it's easy for people to overlook the huge traction that jazz had. And jazz oh, was really, yeah. really important in in British youth culture. And there's, there's, there's I mean, uh, Stranger on the Shore is, is obviously is, uh, Kenny right. Ball and his jazz man. Yeah, uh, Dave are Brubeck. In there. Dave, Dave Brubeck, Brubeck with Unsquare well. Dance. Yeah, yeah. Jazz was, was really, track. really important. You know yeah. what the first ruck was in British youth culture? Was that jazz and? Uh... It wasn't the mods, what was it? Yeah, it was jazz. It was a jazz one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, the, the Bewley Jazz Festival, nineteen sixty. Yeah. It's, it's being broadcast live on the BBC. Yeah. And just as Acca Bilk is ready to come out, there's a big ruck between the, the, the trads and the modern jazz. Yes, yes, you're and right. And the BBC actually. have to take it off the air. Because yeah, yeah. there's this, this Acca Bilk, you know, who yeah. looks about 60 yeah, with, his, yeah. with his bowler hat and his clarinet. And his and Somerset is, accent. <laughs> Somerset. And, and there's this ruck going on between the, the trads and the mods. Uh, jazz was really, really important, and it was after, a vital. And then, but after the Beatles, it, it, it's like that part of history has gone down a cul-de-sac, isn't it? Well, no one remembers the, the important the attraction that jazz had. But jazz was another casualty of that. Remember, yeah, yeah. The Beatles come; they're going to wipe everything off the surface of the music charts. Twist, the twist. Chubby yeah. Checker is in there uh, yeah. with the next twist again. His biggest. Sam Cooke's uh, twisting the night away again in there. And I mentioned Frank Sinatra as well. I mean, Frank Sinatra's one's a humorous one because he's like speaking to the daddies and mummies and say, "Hey, guess what? You know what the kids are all doing now? They're twisting. Everybody's twisting." So literally, you thought the twist, and the twist is really important in the in the trajectory of popular music because it was the first dance. That was created where you danced separately you know separately, you, weren't, yeah. you weren't holding on to the person uh, that you fancied um so and everybody could do it as well because you know it was just okay just use your just round and round and up and down you go again well not quite but you can do that as well yeah yeah that's what that is quite that is what chubby checker that's, said if you go down you're not that's, coming so that's up what again did, that's what twisting, people right? that's what people did before sex was invented but if yeah, you have two yeah. people doing it together you can imagine them having sex so maybe the twist directly Directly leads to the invention of sex. I, I think it might. I, I would. I, I would um, buy that one. <laughs> but what is going on here is that you know when there's a real revolution in music before it comes, uh, or revolution in anything before a revolution comes, there is this moment where the storm is gathering. It's gathering. Yeah. You know things are happening, and you, you can hear you it in, at, in two things here. Like, when you think of "Love Me Do," what do you think of? I think of a little ballad a little jaunty kind of folk song wrong answer you think of harmonica yes yes yeah that, that's the right answer yeah yeah L look at this chart the everly brothers i was going to talk about them yeah they're great yeah talk about it in just a minute I'd, I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about the everly's but th their song is has harmonica all over it mm -hmm. and 
further down the charts, a great song. I'm sure you love. I can imagine this being one of your favourites. Hey, baby, Bruce Chanel. Oh, uh, if I hey hey, you baby, what did you take me for? Of course, harmonica yeah. all I over it. I didn't realise you're absolutely right. You know, why do you That's... think that was then? Why, why did this harmonica, this sort of toy instrument, as it still was? So, okay, the odd blues guys from back in the '40s used it still, but why do you think that was so prominent at this time? I don't know. I don't know. But certainly the Beatles are listening to this and yeah. incorporating that into, into, into Love Me Do. Tell me about the Everly Brothers and Bruce Chanel. I, I'm really fascinated by that uh, thought about the harmonica, though. I must remember that one because I think you've made a really, really strong point there. Well, uh, the Everly Brothers, what I thought of here, and they're doing what it says on the tin. They're, they're obeying the record company and just bringing out more of the same. They know what the formula is. The formula is in this harmony. Brothers have a distinct timbre any brothers any family members have a distinct timbre when they start uh, singing together and the, every know what they've got they they're, they're rinsing it out and putting another sort of yeah maybe slightly throwaway but heartfelt love song to go with the harmonies that they've got how can i meet her actually wasn't a song that i was familiar with because you know you know all the classic yeah, ones wake Kathy's up clown and, yeah what yeah more importantly bye bye love and the reason why i say more importantly when you hear the everlies um doing their thing on this song that's in the charts at this time i'm thinking how can i meet her that is uh fast forward what would it be about 15 years and that is simon and garfunkel doing bye bye love there's a reason why they do bye bye love because simon and Car garfunkel have got that harmony thing going mm. on it's the one song that they do on uh, their classic album, Bridge Over Trouble. With, with, with the Everlies, how much do you think is rock and roll and how much do you think is a folk tradition? Well, they come from a country Western tradition and yeah. rock and roll yeah. and, Western, uh, and the country Western tradition just meet with Elvis Presley. Uh, so uh, I would never call them rock and roll, but they are in the rock and roll era and they are part of the rock and roll hmm. era, a fundamental part of it but they were just unique being brothers who sang harmonies. You know, and hated famous. each other. Well, they did, but I'm not sure if they hated each other at the beginning, but yeah, eventually, you know, brothers do hate each other. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd have to ask the proclaimers <laughs> who are the modern day <laughs> Everly brothers, whether that's true or not. There's a couple of other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do want to rattle through this because a couple of really interesting things. At number 50, got to give a shout out to Sandy Nelson, drumming up a storm. Remember I said the storms are gathering. This is the original drummer of pop music. You know, the drummer was always the background instrumentalist, wasn't supposed to be uh, the matinee idol, but Sandy Nelson is different. He introduces it very, very strongly. Also, another instrumentalist, because as important as saying that this is uh, a chart in an era of uh, the harmonica, it's important to say this is the era also of the instrumentalist. You know, the, yeah, well, yeah. Well, well, why are you laughing so much? It's true. I'm really <laughs> no, getting... it, is, it is. It is because one of my proudest moments on air with you is saying two things to Dwayne Eddy. Uh, <laughs> number one, which he, which he liked, was twang that thing. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And yes. number two, which left which him a little bit like. non, non plus yes. was <laughs> spank that plane. <laughs> You are so mischievous. <laughs> you are so. I'm sure you slipped that one in over my head. I can't remember that. At least that's my argument. I didn't hear a word, Gov. Um, no, but the Dwayne Eddy that's in the charts, and Dwayne Eddy is a matinee idol deep in the heart of Texas. It's one of those old school sort of tunes that he revives in a sort of rock and roll twang way. If you listen to Dwayne Eddy, and let me refer back to Jet Harris that I mentioned earlier. Jet Harris's bass. Jet Harris did this unique thing with a bass guitar. He added two strings onto it. So when you go back and you listen to uh, Jet Harris playing um, Mucho Bueno, Bueno Mucho, whatever it is called, Besame, Besame Mucho, Kiss Me A Lot. Um, when you listen to that, it's not unlike uh, Dwayne Eddy and mm. um, it's got the Dwayne Eddy twang about it although Dwayne Eddy's playing a six string guitar Jet Harris has innovated the six string bass 
and he is such a genius. I'm telling you, it's so sad because he ended up having mental health problems and then, you know, his career disappearing because, you know, he couldn't take the sort of strain of pop life and everything like that. But he is, I feel, the most innovative of all the British artists in this charts as British artists are trying to find their own feet after what would it be now about eight years of following or seven years of following the Americans toe for toe in terms of rock and roll. So it's an amazing charts because it does, mm. does, it is a crossroads. It is a crossroads and uh, lots of sad stories in the charts as well. When you look at it, you know, just the other day, uh, Clyde McFatter died. Mm. Now Clyde McFatter was original drifters, but as a solo singer, oh my goodness. He comes close to Sam Cooke in a different way. The person that really comes close to Sam Cooke here is a South African um, artist who seen by many as a British artist because he was living over here. That's Danny Williams, you know. Danny Williams is a really interesting guy. They try to push him a bit too much into the... Um, British Sam Cooke mould and it doesn't quite fit into that but he's the closest thing to Sam Cooke that you wear but of course Sam Cooke will die very shortly after this or uh, so he is. a couple of years a couple of years yeah later yeah. in a very tragic way uh, you've already you know mentioned one or two other people along the way who have bitten the dust uh, Adam Faith would end up dying way before his time. Um, I know a friend of mine who was an actor during the budgie days, uh, Adam Faith drove my mate to the south of France because he was doing some kind of filming down there, drove him all the way to the south of France, or either drove him there or drove him back in his Rolls Royce. Those are the days, mate, mm. uh, for Adam Faith and everything, but you know, he couldn't get hit after uh, this time. Another well, not sad story, but positive story because she's still alive is Ketty Lester there with love letters. A lot of people have done this. Uh, famously, um, what's her name? Uh, Alison Moye did a version of this, which is really, really good, actually. I've got to give it to her. I don't think Elvis Presley did it any justice, but this is a song that comes out of nowhere. And it's one of those bittersweet, slightly dark songs that you'd have loved to have heard Eartha Kitt do. But Ketty Lester does a good version. Um, I think the original version in, in an Eartha Kitt kind of way. Ketty Lester's still alive. You know, she was yeah. in uh, Little House on the Prairie. She became an actress, yeah. Yeah, another one that became another an actress amongst yeah. all these things. And Brenda Lee, of course, well, she was the American version of uh, Helen Shapiro or vice versa, if you want to do it that way. The one tune that I will say that pissed me off was the Vernon's Girls version of Lover Please, which is a Clyde McFatter song. Now, if you hear Clyde McFatter, honestly, it's, Clyde McFatter's voice was so dramatic from the moment he starts singing that. They, in those days, people didn't even pretend that we're doing an original cover. They're just like, let's just rip it off. So you've got these girls, the Vernon girls. I've got nothing against them. I don't even know who they are, the Vernon's girls. But how on earth could they show their face again when they had basically destroyed one of the finest jovial, positive songs from the late 50s rock and roll era. This was matinee idol stuff, like I'm saying. So Clyde mm. McFatter, he was dressing up as if he was going to be, uh, a few years later, uh, Marvin Gaye. This is where Marvin Gaye gets it from, you know, yeah. Mar uh, Clyde. But Love Her Please used to be one of my favourite rock and roll songs as a teddy boy. And when I heard that, I just thought, wow. You know, what, what, one of my favourite things about, about the land of my birth is, is that relationship that we as white kids had with black music. I love that. It, 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 it never ceases to knock me out, the depth of it. I think it was Sam Cooke, probably around this time, because he didn't have very long left, coming over. And, you know, Sam Cooke, he's, he's had to do stuff the American way, meaning, you no, know, he's got like one act for his black audiences and, and his, in his nightclub act for his white audiences. And it's when he, when he comes over to England, he, he doesn't, have to, doesn't have to do it. You know, the, white, the blacker you are for the white audience in England, brilliant, they'll have it. And I think that's, that, that, that's great. I, I love the fact of, of all of the things that we can, we can moan about from... from uh, no, you're right. But I, I love the fact that, that... And it's the reason for me why Britain is so important musically, because we've, we've got that 
connection with black American music without the racial hangups. And it, it, it's, it's allowed white, black, Asian, British kids to feel that all of this is ours as well. It's a playground that we can play in. Well, I, I think I'll go beyond that. I'll go beyond that and say this is why Britain is so important in the whole story of multiculturalism. Why do you think everybody wants to come here, Tim? I mean, the British people Must can't be the understand. Weather. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> British people, a lot of British people can't understand why all these foreigners want to come, you know, to live in our country. That's why they vote for Brexit or whatever it might be, some people say. And I totally get it. Of all the, even if you can't speak English, of all the European countries, I'm going to leave America out of this because I think you could argue it for America in a different kind of way. But of all those European countries, which is the one country that it is easy to assimilate into because of the way the British people themselves have assimilated all these other cultural you know, um, influences from all around the world. It's, it's Britain. It's not like that in France. France has assimilated a lot, but it's also set up so many barriers. Yeah. I mean, it's set up Well, a there's such a definite French identity. Exactly. And they're always... With... Well, they, they, they've all always been wrestling, certainly over the last 100 years or so, 150 years maybe. They've been wrestling in competition with English, you know, the English dominance. We haven't... We, 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 we haven't taken part in that wrestle. We, you know, that arm wrestle is the French that are doing it. We're just going about our business, very comfortable in our own skins. We don't have to impose laws to say, oh, you have to play 50% English music on the radio, or, you know, you have to speak French like, you know, we speak no more speaking English. So their prime minister will, or their president will never speak in English at a, at a summit, you know, when everybody else speaks English, he'll always speak in French. Whereas our queen goes over there, I'll speak French. You want me to speak French? Yeah, I'll speak French. I could speak French, probably could speak German as well. Who knows? She might even be able to speak Yoruba. But the point I'm trying to make is <laughs> there's no hang up about it. You come yeah. to Britain and you assimilate because look what we've done to the music. Look what we've done to uh, culture, literature, and everything else. That's what we've given the world, the ability to be able to absorb all these things. And if you fight against it, you're not really British. June the 10th, 1962. How long before you arrived on this island? And then how long before you f felt, this is my island as well? It will be three years and three June, uh, three years and three months before I arrive on this island. And obviously, I was just six years old at the time of arrival. Um, and I, I think after about a week, when my old man had enough of me moaning that I want to go back home, uh, he tried everything uh, to placate because <laughs> You know, my old man and my stepmother were here first. So me and my brother, who was a year older than me, came over subsequently. And um, my father left um, his youngest son at the time back in Nigeria, not least because my brother father had um, health issues and so on. So left him with our grandmother for another, uh, after we arrived, maybe another th four, four or five years. And, um, and we lived in a bed sit. You know, so we, we left my grandmother's home in Nigeria um, that my grandfather built, huge house, and we arrived to live in a bedsit with only a curtain between my father and my stepmother and we, the two younger boys, to, you know, to uh, protect their modesty. And for the first week or so, I just cried and wanted to go back to Nigeria and only spoke in Yoruba, even though the previous year, my grandmother had insisted we only spoke in English in Nigeria. And uh, my father tried everything, tried to placate me by buying me a cowboy outfit and buying me a toy rail <laughs> rifle with, you know, little caps in it and everything. And after about a week, he said, right, that's enough. That's enough, enough of that, bad enough of that. You're here, forget all of that. And I think at that moment, uh, Nigeria started fading. <laughs> I'm, I'm so only six you, years your, old. Your, your own spontaneous free will and volition. <laughs> exactly. I'm six years old, mate. Well, Give me a break. While you're saying all that, I'm hearing in the background, I'm hearing the shadows and wonderful land. 
Ah, you know, the first songs that I probably got into in the UK that I remember getting into, uh, lo no, not Love Me Do, it'll be um, She Loves You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we all live in a yellow submarine. And I remember at the age of uh, seven going, we were living in Wimbledon at this point, uh, going into, um, or having all these friends who were skinheads and they were into their reggae. I didn't know what reggae was, but we'd go down the street going, oh, bloody, oh, bloody, <laughs> love goes on. Whoa. Not having a clue where the music comes from. Mm -hmm. But the skinheads knew and they embraced me as their friend. So, um, you know, after school, th there was a park right next door to my school. I went to a school called Garfield School in those days when I was seven years old. There was a park right next door. I couldn't wait for four o'clock as it was in those days or quarter to four to roll around. So I'd rush out to the park to meet all these kids. We'd just like be hanging out by the kids swings and have mm -hmm. nothing to do. So mm -hmm. my first snogs, I know you're going to say, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on a second, <laughs> Tim. I was seven <laughs> years old. What would you do? Early done? starter. Early you know, starter. If, if your girl comes <laughs> Oh, geez, go give me a snog. I was like, whoa, you know, didn't even know what I was doing. But it's first time. Anyway, yeah. Can we leave it there? <laughs> Come outside. Yeah, very well said. <laughs> Thank you.